Um, hi, um, I'm Izzy Iqbal, um, and I'm going to be talking about queer mechanics in competitive video games. Um, a bit about me is that I'm an interaction designer, um, and I was, I'm queer, and I grew up in a Muslim household where I wasn't allowed to um, express who I was. So I did so by playing video games, specifically competitive video games. Um, my only qualifications about talking about this is that I've been playing competitive video games my entire life. <laughs> okay, so my talk is um, really inspired by Naomi, by Naomi um, Clark and Mary Copas' talk on queerness and beyond, um, rethinking human game relations, specifically on the ideas they mentioned about queer mechanics and the interactions between players and the rest of the community. Since we're going to be talking about queer mechanics, the first thing we should discuss is the nature of the word queer and how it's applied to things like game mechanics. I think the most common way to think of the word queer is the LGBTQ sense. Naomi, in her talk, describes that it's easier to think of the verb word of queer and what it means to queer something. This verb version of the word relates to an older definition of being unfamiliar on, or on the fringes of society, sometimes opposing the status quo. Naomi also defines queer as being bound up with the idea of resisting dominant and naturalized narrative categories, thus queer comes with a politic. And one of her best definitions is that it's a relentlessly unfixed signifier, meaning that queer is always changing and that the status quo changes as new normals are generated. Merritt says that the idea of that the game's rules rather than its imagery can encode queerness or more often heteronormativity. That taking a mechanical or rules-based approach to queerness is harder than looking at narrative for many of us because while it's easy to look at the presence of an absence of same-sex relationships and queer characters, it's not as easy to pin down what exactly a queer mechanic looks like. So then what is the status quo when it comes to mechanics in competitive games? There's a popular term called the metagame, or more loosely referred to as the meta. Metagaming refers to as when players attempt to predict what other, another player is trying to do, and thus adapts their playstyle and mechanics choice accordingly. The term metagame, however, loosely refers to what strategies and choices are the most efficient when it comes to winning. A player may see that a certain character or a certain item is considered meta because it's expected to be seen in the competitive landscape. The interesting thing about the metagame is that it's ever-shifting, especially in, the, in games that are constantly receiving balance patches. It exists entirely independently of the game, and rather inside the game's community. What becomes popular is based off of trends, off players seeing success in other players doing certain things and mimicking them to get the desired result, which is victory. A simple example of metagaming is seen in um, the fire, water, grass trinity in Pokemon. You know that if your, opponent, if your opponent is going to be using a fire type Pokemon, then it's a wise decision to use a water type Pokemon, and probably not the best decision to use a grass type. But those are only three types out of the 18 in Pokemon. Once you start to introduce the other elemental types, metagaming becomes a less simple task, as different types can emerge at any given time with their weaknesses and strengths. Players have to account for the variables and make mechanic selection based on the natural balance that the game has created. Game balance is a particularly arbitrary concept in competitive games, and that designers are attempting to properly scale characters in relation to one another and create a sense of equilibrium. But this, of course, proves difficult when characters are fundamentally different from one another. They all have their own particular strengths and weaknesses, and that is what's supposed to make the game diverse when it comes to mechanic selection, and that a player can maximize how they utilize their strengths and how they avoid having their own weaknesses exploited. With mechanics coming from all sorts of different angles and levels, changing rules in ways that other mechanics simply don't, um, and, or maybe even adding a new set of rules, it increasingly seems impossible to keep everything in equilibrium. Even chess itself, which is considered a very well-balanced game in that players have the same exact pieces, is not perfectly balanced because white has a natural advantage by going first. However, the black player can then attempt to metagame the first move and predict the rest of white player's decisions um, and plan accordingly. Thus, the metagame is the and the natural balance of a game have a very close relationship in that players are trying to determine what the strongest mechanics are, what their mechanics um, and, the, and the measures which they can take to beat them. Of course, this is all based off of player perception, but it becomes part of the collective consciousness of the game's community. One of my favorite examples of the metagame in the competitive game is Nintendo's Super Smash Brothers, particularly in Super Smash Brothers Melee. The Smash Bros. series was never intended to be a well-balanced one versus one competitive game. It was designed to be a free-for-all party game, and that a lot of the stages and a lot of the game mechanics involve random events, like explosions that can occur at any given time. Items fall from the sky, um, 
Things like a hammer that can cause a one-hit KO, or a tomato that will heal you to full health. However, the game enables you to turn off these items in the stable stages, allowing players to create a landscape where they feel things are more balanced. I view this itself as a clear act because players are defining the game that was meant to be designed. Players have assembled a competitive standard that is almost universal at tournaments and competitive events. Of course, some players mock this rigidity in stage selection with the phrase, no items, Fox only a final destination, and criticize competitive players for banning mechanics that make the game more fun. However, a very interesting and energetic playstyle emerged from this competitive mode. Players began to analyze the success rates and overall strength of characters and matchups. This generated tier lists of the strongest characters ranked in numerical order. These tier lists are the direct product of the metagame, and they, they are changed over the years as player skill sets evolve and as strategies emerge and vanish. Some of the most played characters in the competitive melee, in competitive melee are Marth, Fox, and Sheik, which are all extremely fast characters with diverse movesets and a bunch of tools they can utilize to address the strengths of other characters. Additionally, these characters pair very well with some advanced techniques um, that the player base discovered through a series of glitches. And glitches are another very interesting facet of queer expression in games and that, Naomi explains, exists by literally defining the code in original design. One of these glitches is called wave dashing, which allows the player to move efficiently by pressing three buttons together quickly um, and to slide across the ground. This slide can be paired with very strong attacks to make efficient and quick combos. However, it's a very mentally and physically taxing motion, and, while, and it takes a while to learn and apply in a high-stress competitive environment. These are the characters and the strategies and play styles that you expect to see in a melee tournament, which are still happening today. The community, as seen by the tier list, identify these characters as top tier and back these decisions with win and loss percentages, proving that choosing these characters wields more positive results and thus victory. However, there's a famous Japanese Link player named Aniki who can consistently best the best players in the world. Aniki is, ranked, is playing the 16th ranked character when it comes to the tier list, and also refuses to incorporate wave dashing into his mechanic repertoire. By utilizing the fact that Link's mechanics are queer in the metagame, that he has three ranged projectiles that behave differently, his attacks are slower and more sweeping, sword strikes, especially his iconic spin attack, which can be used as a tool to address fast characters. He's also one of two characters in melee that has a ranged grab, Though it has a huge delay of miss, it can be used to, to create strategically, strategic placements that other characters simply can't do. Using these mechanics, he's, create, he's able to create a playstyle that is unfamiliar, a different, and ultimately queer in the competitive melee landscape. Another really fascinating idea to me that Naomi Merritt mentioned is that glitches are literally queer instances of where the code and rule sets interact in a way that was never meant to. However, this queer instance became popular and utilized to, the, to advance the main goal of players, which is victory. It became part of the metagame, and thus commonplace. If you are watching a high-level competitive Smash game, you are expecting to see wave dashing and other advanced mechanics. Aniki's refusal to participate in this, in this metagame is a part of a queer act, and by framing up processing needed to complete this maneuver, he is approaching the game in a completely different way, and thus has an advantage with his queer playstyle. Aniki is a truly rare example of a player who has a notably queer playstyle and is also competitively successful. A lot of the other successful players will still gravitate towards the top tier characters. Perhaps this is because those, those characters are mechanics they actually like and identify with. Or maybe it's because they're scared of the potential and possible constant failure that could emerge from playing with characters and mechanics that they actually like. The next game I'd like to discuss is League of Legends. League of Legends, or most commonly referred to as League, is, it, is defined as a multiplayer online battle arena, or MOBA, that is designed solely for player competition. It is designed by Riot and is currently one of the most played esports titles today. It is free to play, but was reported to have generated $624 million in 2013. The game consists of two teams of five, composed of the game's many different characters, attempting to destroy each other's defenses and eventually their nexus, which, which results in victory. There are three lanes, referred to as top lane, which goes along the left and the top of the map, middle lane, which goes diagonally through the bottom left and through the top right corners, and bottom lane, which eventually leads to the main nexus. Or, and bottom lane, which is on the top, the bottom, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't write that up in the notes. Um, and they all eventually lead to the nexus, which is at the bottom left corner or the, in the top right corner. Destroying each nexus is the victory condition for each, for each game instance. Creatures called minions or creeps spawn in equal amounts and go down the lanes, and actually meeting at the center. In each lane, there are three strong towers that will attack everything that gets in its range. 
The game refers to any of the non-lane areas, the areas between the lanes, as the jungle. Here there are neutral creeps and objectives that the players can earn at the cost of straying away from the natural defense of their towers. The game is in a natural, equilib is in his natural equilibrium state, um, and its landscape won't change until players go and defeat minions, gaining experience and gold which can be made to make their characters stronger. All players start at level 1, with the max being 18, and have only a bit of gold to purchase a few simple items. Players can use the gold they generate to purchase up to six items that will generate the, that will give their characters additional stats and effects, which will improve their which will dra dramatically improve their strengths and cover the weaknesses, or address the weaknesses and strengths of other characters that are getting notably strong within that game. So, with 123 characters to choose from and plenty of variable item choices and combinations, one would think that the game would have a ton of variety and mechanics to choose from, but that's actually not the case. The meta game is incredibly prevalent in the league and that some players almost follow it religiously. Just like Smash Bros, League has its own tier list of characters that they believe to be the strongest out of the game. But because a player is, is cooperating with four other teammates, there's a social responsibility regenerated by the other players to play something that is considered strong, viable, and results in victory. The metagame almost dictates that certain characters go into certain positions on the map. That a very strong defense style character referred to as a tank go top lane. A, straight, a strong bursty dam damage dealer go into the middle lane, and a sustained damage dealer go into the bottom lane. The fourth player is expect expected to support and sustain the damage dealer in the bottom lane, and the last player is expected to gain their gold and experience in the jungle. Players expect other players to abide by these guidelines in the game, even though they're not codified or actual mechanics themselves. Despite the cast of 123 characters, players are expected to choose from the limited pool of characters that are, being cons that are considered strong amongst the community. They expect players to purchase the ones that are predetermined items for the character, and nothing else, despite how, despite how vital it can actually be. The worst part is the backlash a player will get if they choose to experiment. If they choose to clear the game and attempt to discover something new and potentially very exciting. If a player attempts to do something outside of the meta, they're, they're very likely to be flamed and harassed by their teammates for this decision, and there's a good chance that they might be reported or even banned. Which is what's such a mess about competitive games in general, that it all comes back to things like power structures and dominance and, and success. The metagame itself is constructed around thoughts of mechanical efficiency for the sake of victory. We have communities that will bow down to any professional players and their decisions and choices simply because they are victorious, all around ignoring the original point of what games seem to be about. Are they about fun or are they about winning and money and, pre and presenting dominance over your enemies? Are they about being right all the time and showing everyone in the world that you know what you're doing? Or should the games be about learning about another person, about being in a community, about teaching a friend about an awesome new mechanic and an interaction that you discovered? How wonderful would it be if we could be nice and accepting and supportive of, of, of other people in a digital realm where it's so easy to make a mistake? It's so easy to lose and fail and never come back because of the fear of disappointing others and being flamed for being nothing more than not being good at a game. Merritt herself says, if games provide a safe space for failure, then why is it that so many women and so many queers fall out of gaming? It's because of things like the metagame and their pressure to win and always be successful or being pushed to importance, and ideas like exploration and discovery are discouraged, and in a game like League, it can result in harassment and potentially being banned. The last game I'll, I'll be discussing is called Dawn Game. It's made by a company generated by EA called Waste on, Waste on Games, and also a mo it's also a mobile like League. But the design team took a brand new approach to the game. Donkey is a try to game is a game that tried to break all the presumptions of a competitive game. Its tagline is break the meta, and their goal was to create this game where there was no right way to play, where characters could be any role despite their assigned role through thoughtful, thoughtful and creative choices. The Donkey player community is one of the best I've ever experienced out of a competitive game, with players being nice and helpful and, and with supportive comments and friendly advice as opposed to raging and flaming. The developers themselves would participate in the forum community and would even be seen in regular games. Donkey itself was literally a queer MOBA as players were joining it were trying to find a new spin on the game. The genre itself queered the, queered, the game itself queered the genre as it attempted to change a lot of the presumptions of the MOBA game and allow every player, including passive support style characters, to have a huge impact. They had four various roles that would allow all players to gain economy in very different ways. The two lane map setup allowed for more lane to lane interaction as opposed to stale economy wars that's seen in the first quarter of the game in League. The stat and itemization um, system eliminates useless stats for characters. Every character gets some sort of possible benefit from all the items in the game, so every item is a possible purchase for characters. 
While there are some passive effects that don't make sense on, on certain characters, overall the potential and play styles from those setups are quite unlimited. Additionally, they had a comic that followed each character's interactions with each other and the struggles, and the struggles um, that they had over power and control, and for some characters, their avoidance of it. Each character has a backstory that is intertwined with other characters, and their phenotypes range from cute fairy critters to angsty teenagers, dark-skinned scooter-riding bandits, and a Ukrainian she-centaur. <laughs> they would interact with, with each other in the game, commenting on their relationships and their eagerness in fighting, in fighting or fear of each other. Games have a narrative and, and a progression to them, and each instance is meant to represent an event in the game, and a loss does not seem so much as a player failure as a chapter in a growing story. Players also have the ability to cast their votes on the character's decisions in the main story in a future called Living Lore. By playing games, players earn votes that they could use to choose one major plot point or another. Using a character that was somehow involved in, in that plot point would allow for three votes instead of one, causing inter interesting shifts in the metagame because based on narrative choices rather than just victory. Dongate was a game where one could play a gay female otter who was designed to be a strong damage dealer as a pure defensive support. And while it'd be strange and potentially difficult, it was still technically viable and had the potential to be very successful. Unfortunately, on November 5th, EA announced that Dongate servers would be coming down on February 5th of 2015. The game had not been doing as well as they hoped. And after all, gaming is supposed to be a profitable industry. In the end, it's hard to ignore the fact that something as queer as Dongate is being dropped over cap capitalistic values. While Dongate is leaving, it did show us that there could be instances of competitive games where players were motivated to be creative and find their own play styles within the game, rather than mimicking what they are told is successful. Of course, it's only natural for players to want to succeed, and that is probably what the realm that they're coming from from other games. But Dongate also protects and promotes players to seek other win objectives and to experiment. It asks us to discover the weird and undiscovered, undiscovered mechanical interactions, the queer ones, to break the meta and ultimately enjoy the entire journey. And it's pleasant to know that games, that there are games that are still considered competitive that have the capacity to do that. If we continue to create com communities within them, where things like exploration and discovery are just as important as victory and success, where players can decide what their own objective is and find themselves in the mechanics of the game. Thank you.